Praise God. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Now, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, but we'll just do a quick recap before we get there. But uh, those of you who have been with me at the conference, uh, uh, in a conference there's a, a slightly different teaching and anointing that, that takes place than there is in, in church on Sunday mornings. And so at the conference it took me three sessions, three hours, to cover what we lo- covered last Sunday uh, because there's extra things that flow. But there was something that flowed there towards the end, which is where we'll get to today. Uh, and uh, we just want to, again, just quickly build a foundation uh, to, to position ourselves correctly for where we want to go and for what the Lord wants to do. But last week, if you remember, we talked about living inside out. Living inside out. If you were listening and receiving, and I know you were during the offering lesson earlier, then you started to catch the heart and the, the essence of what, of what we were talking about, what the Lord is talking about. So Proverbs chapter 4, and from verse 20, we'll read this again. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put a perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Praise God. Now, if you remember, I quoted uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland, um, some words that I uh, heard him speak just a couple of weeks ago in Fort Worth at the Minister's Convention. And uh, he said this, spiritual things are from the outs- inside out. Spiritual things are from the inside out. Natural things are from the outside in. Now that's, I mean, that is probably one of the, the simplest things I've ever heard. <laughs> in one sense, I mean, that's, you know, that doesn't even sound profound in some sense, but it is so, it, it is so true that it's easy to skip over. Everything that is spiritual comes from the inside out. God has put eternity in our hearts. The Holy Spirit Himself lives on the inside of us. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so there is nothing that the Holy Spirit does on the earth now since He made residence on the inside of the church. There is nothing He does on the the earth now that doesn't come through us. Now there is, I just want to qualify that, in terms of the conviction of the world, but even in that, even in that, the church has a place because we've got to go out and preach truth and the Holy Ghost will take that proclamation of truth and He, and, and he will bring a conviction or he will, he will touch the hearts of people. The Bible says that the, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. But you and I have a place on this planet where the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us and He doesn't go around, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't just uh, go around and there's a sick person and just all of a sudden, you know, poof, this sick person gets healed for no particular reason by the Holy Ghost. He's taken up residence on the inside of us. And so the doorway from heaven to earth by the Holy Ghost is through the body of Christ. Now we know this. We've, we've studied this before, but I'm just recounting it again to under, for us to understand it. Because one thing, it's one thing to hear, it's one thing to say, yes, amen, it's one thing to give mental assent to something. It's another thing on Monday morning to go out and live this. To live inside out. To live inside out. Praise God. And so we, we talked about three things. And uh, really, we, we, we're not trying to cover all these in this part. We're going to go through these as we go in the next weeks and months even. Uh, three things, three basic doctrines that we need to understand that, are going to, that help us to live this way. Number one is you are made up of three parts, a spirit, a soul, and a body. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. 
Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says it in that order. Not body, soul, and spirit. That would be to be flesh-minded first or flesh-conscious first. The 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How does that happen? By the Holy Spirit. Now, we've identified the three parts of man. It's impossible to understand those or perceive those in the natural. You have to allow the Word of God to do that for you. The Word, the, the word of God is the only way that you can perceive this. And when Jesus was talking uh, to Nicodemus about being born again, Nicodemus is struggling to gain this concept, and so God gives it to him. Uh, 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 or rather, Jesus speaks to him and says, it's, it's spiritually discerned. You can't, you can't do this just in and of yourself. And so the Word of God, as Hebrews 4.12 says, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Holy Spirit is the only thing able to come in and rightfully divide between the soul and the spirit. So we are created a speaking spirit. And as I quoted uh, from the Chumash, uh, Genesis 2.7, the commentaries made on that, uh, a speaking spirit is the term used. Uh, and also this statement, God thus made man out of both the lower earthly and upper heavenly matter. Praise the Lord. So we talked briefly, and I'm, I'm doing a really quick recap here. So if you weren't here last week, go back and get the CD, download the MP3, something, and listen to it over again. But the born-again spirit on the pneuma, uh, is, is no longer the place of contestation for the enemy, no longer the place of warfare. When we talk about spiritual warfare, it's not warfare over your spirit. Your spirit has been divinely connected to the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says we've been made one spirit with Him. The Holy Spirit, by definition, is holy, separate. He cannot be in communication with something unholy. He cannot be divinely linked with something impure. He is holy. He didn't stop being the Holy Spirit when He came to live inside of you. Does that make sense? He's still separate. But your spirit was separated unto Him. Made pure. The blood of Jesus sanctified that. The blood of Jesus qualified that. You were recreated in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so that's what took place. Inside of you, 1 Peter 1.23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed. Not of corruptible seed. When you got born again, it was not a corruptible seed. In other words, incorruptible. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. This is the seed. This is the seed that was sown into a piece of dirt on the ground to make Adam. This is the same seed that was sown into the womb of Mary to make Jesus. And it's the same seed that was sown into you to make you as a born again, in relationship person with God. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad about that? I mean, isn't that good news? It really is. And so we then find that second thing. The first thing is you're a tripart being. Spirit, soul, and body. The second doctrine, the second thing that we need to understand so that we can live from the inside out accurately, biblically, is that righteousness and holiness are not the same thing. Righteousness and holiness are not the same thing. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's what happened to your spirit. There's nothing you could do about that to make that happen in your own efforts. You've been made righteous. He was made to be sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He was made to be sin that you might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Amen. But holiness is different. Now we're going to spend some time, so I'm not going to do it here, we're going to spend some time on the difference between righteousness and holiness. Okay, we're going to define those things. Because righteousness enables holiness. That you are right. You've been made right. 
And the grace of God, the empowerment of God, that, that which you are, have been made right, enables you to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. There, there is a righteousness, there is a holiness to be lived. There is. There is a holy life that is to be lived. And it is the best life ever. It is. It is. But if you confuse righteousness and holiness, then you'll be trying to live a righteous life. Trying to live a righteous life. No. You are the righteousness of God. And through that, you are able to live a holy life. Okay? But we will spend more time on that. The third thing was that there are three groups of people. Uh, And according to uh, the Scriptures, we find out that there are, it says, give no offense to the Jews, to the Greeks or the Gentiles, or to the church of God. So the three groups of people on the earth. Before the cross, there were two groups of people on the earth. There were the Jews and the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations. Okay? At the cross, and if you were at the conference, uh, some of you were there when Patsy Caminetti was teaching. I, I, God told me not to touch that. Why? Because she taught on it. <laughs> she did she taught on them and gave, gave great revelation and understanding of that. And so we find that out. We find that now since the cross, since, since the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, since Pentecost, we have now a church. And the church is the one new man in Christ Jesus. Now, I have a Jewish heritage. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm excited about that. It's given me great insight in, into the past. But when I got born again, I became, I became one new man in Christ Jesus. I don't have, forget my Jewishness. But to be biblically accurate and do, doctrinally correct, we have to understand the one new man. We have to understand the one new man in Christ Jesus made up of Jew and Gentile, grafted in together. Okay? The Gentile nations, we understand, and we, we're not going to go into the whole discourse, but grafted into the vine. And, you know, Paul gives emphasis and, and gives uh, great weight to, to, uh, to what it meant to be Jewish and, and, and all that he says that. Was there any value in it? Yes, there is, he says. But understand that one new man in Christ Jesus. But now we see three, three peoples on the earth. We see the world, the Babylonian system. That We see that whole, that whole worldly system of, of people outside of covenant with God. We see the Jewish nation and we understand that there is still a purpose in God for them. There is still prophetic purpose. There are still things yet to be outworked from the Scriptures concerning Israel. And then there's the church. And it's intrinsically linked. And as Patsy Caminetti so, so, so powerfully said, that God is moving in all three groups and upon all three groups. And sometimes as the church, we only ever focus or see what He's doing amongst ourselves. But God's actually moving out there, just like He did on Nebuchadnezzar, just like He did on Cyrus, just like He did on other people outside of God, outside of Israel. Just like the Roman centurion that came up to Jesus in that particular time outside of Israel. Do you, know, do you understand what I'm saying? Just like throughout history, some of, the, some of the people who were not a part of Israel made it into the lineage of Jesus. <laughs> Wonderfully so. Marvelously so. But even in rulers of nations, and it was interesting, something else that Patsy said, I'm going to preach Patsy's sermon here, but just something else that she said that, was, that, was, that was, uh, really stood out to me is, is that when we talk about Daniel, who was not called to, his, to Israel, he didn't function as a prophet to Israel. He functioned apart from, he pr- functioned in a place of exile. And he was, he, he was, the, uh, 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 he was God's voice to a, a leader's of Babylon over many, many years. But the Bible only records three out of a number of Babylonian leaders over that piece of time. There are some that don't even get a mention. There are some that their life was so insignificant to the, to the plan and purpose of God, they're not even mentioned in Scripture. And yet one man, super, one man lasted them all, Daniel. Daniel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. 
And so, we understand that we have a spirit. We have a soul. That soul is the gateway to your spirit and your heart. The soul is what made that decision or made that choice to submit to the spirit on the day you got born again. Your spirit was still yet unregenerate. Still in spiritual death. And you came into submission to the word, the power of God that came in the gospel message. Put it in your heart, believed it, spoke it out of your mouth. The person and presence of the Holy Spirit came and regenerated, renewed your spirit on the inside. You stepped out of darkness into his marvelous light. Aren't you glad about that? Praise God. Your soul, your soul is that part of you, your mind, will, and emotions that that needs to come into that place of renewal, being transformed and renewed, and into submission where it makes those choices in line with your spirit. And so we we looked at a number of scriptures, and I won't go over them all right now. Romans 12, 1 and 2, and, and the like. Praise God. And then your body. The body of a born-again believer. It's not been made and transformed as it will be one day. God's left it in this current form only because it authorizes you to walk around on this planet. If he changed you now, you wouldn't be able to be resident here until God makes a new heaven and a new earth. But that doesn't mean he, you have to put up with your body in any form of sickness or disease or pain or suffering. But he has given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the purchased possession. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Your glorified body's already been purchased. It's already been bought. It's like, it's like a brand new car that's already been paid for and, and it, you're just waiting for delivery. That's exactly how it is. <laughs> you're just waiting for delivery. And we know that we can't take delivery right now because if we did, we'd have to drive off into the sunset <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> Head out on the highway. All right, so... Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory? 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that what, that we know, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. For we shall see Him as He is. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 1, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly and desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Adam and Eve were found naked because that glory left them. We will be reclothed with that glory. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So Romans 8.11 says, The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in you and gives life to your mortal flesh. That's the guarantee. That's the promise. He, he's in there affecting every cell in your being if you'll let him do that. Hallelujah. So what does this mean for us? It means everything necessary to live a victorious life has been done and supplied for you by the grace of God. Everything has been given to you. The Holy Spirit has been given as the counsel, the parakletos, the one who comes alongside. The Word of God has been given to you for the renewing of the mind. To be able to live and transform it and renew it and, and the power of God that's in it is living and active and it divides between soul and spirit and enables you. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The, all of this is the grace of God. All has been given to you. Praise God. Everything, every part of it. You now have the responsibility to appropriate and apply those gifts to your life. You have to unwrap the boxes. I wouldn't be strange if, if on Christmas morning... Or let's just even take a birthday. 
And, uh, and there's this pile of presents. They're all wrapped up, bows on them. I mean, some nice stuff sitting there, big, shiny, silver wrapping paper. And, and, and there you are, and, and, and here you go. And you give these presents to someone, and they just stand there and look at them. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. <laughs> but never open them. Glory. <laughs> no, that's there. Yeah, it's glory. It's wonderful. It's great. Thank you for the gifts. Now unwrap them. Get into it. Oh, oh I'm like this. I'm not one of... Uh, are you one of those... those you know, the, t- picking at the, uh, at the sellotape, peeling that back, and then unfold. Are you one of those? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rip into it kind of guy. I'm not keeping that paper again. <laughs> it's, that's, that's, it's going to be destroyed if you... Don't spend a lot of wrapping paper. No, you can if you want to, but I'm, just go- I'm going to rip into it. It's going to come up, and I'm into that present. <laughs> you can wrap it in a newspaper. You want. I don't care. I'll care. I don't. I care about what's in the box. Hallelujah. I want to get into it because this is a present. This is a gift. I treasure this. I value this, and I'm going to get into this. I'm going to take a hold of this. It's mine. It's been given to me. Praise the Lord. And God has given you life and life abundantly. He's put this life in you in abundance, and He wants you to unwrap it. He, he, all of this gift, all of this grace. It, grace is no good to you if you don't walk in it. The supply of God, the sufficiency of God is no good to you if you're not walking it out. How do we do this? You walk it out in the Spirit. You've got to walk from the inside out. All of these gifts have been placed on the inside of you and they've got to find their expression and their way out through you. Hallelujah. You know, one of the most powerful things you can do is spend much time praying in the Holy Ghost. Much time speaking in other tongues. Bringing those heavenly gifts out. Speaking it out. Releasing prophetically even those words. Praise God. But she's so cute. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She can come up here and stand with me if she wants. It'll make me look good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we need to simply submit to that work of grace. We do. We need to throw off the old man. Open the package. Let it come and flow from the inside out. I believe too many Christians have lived, died, and gone to heaven and have never really fully flowed in all that they've got. I don't want to get to heaven and find a room full of supply. And when I say a room full, like warehouse, <laughs> of supply that I never used. It was, I mean, it had, and my name's on the door. I don't want to get there and find that. You know? And there's beyond heaven anyway. Praise the Lord in this time and that, which is in, that time which is to come. There's too many Christians who have lived that way. I'm, I'm not going to. I, I, I heard a message one time, I thought it was excellent. Live full and die empty. And he gave the illustration of the prophet of God. Do you remember they, uh, they were about to bury someone and, uh, and there was uh, an army coming or something and so they threw him down into a grave of a prophet? Remember that? Was it Elijah, wasn't it? Yeah. And the moment this dead body hit the bones of the dead prophet, he came back to life. And this guy said, there was still some anointing left in it. He was supposed to die empty there. He hadn't finished. He was another resurrection left in there. <laughs> now we want to live full and die empty. I mean, I want to, I want, when I breathe my last, if, if the Lord tarries, I, I want to do it knowing that I have, I have allowed every ounce of grace that God put in me to flow out through me. Every single one. Praise God. In this day and this hour, we're seeing the birth pangs of the end of the age upon us. Jesus described it. He talked about it. Wars, rumors of wars. We're seeing the birth pangs. It's not as intense as it will be at one stage. Right now, we're seeing the birth pangs of the part we'll see here. We need to know how to live and flow this and allow this Zoe life to flow out of us. 
living from the inside out. <clears throat> now here's the part I want to get to today. The greatest flow of the life of the Spirit that can ever come from you and through you, the greatest authorization of that flow, the greatest impact of the fl that flow, the greatest uh, legal expression even of that flow of the law of the Spirit of life is governed by love. And I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about feelings. Nothing more than feelings. <laughs> I, I, I'm going I'm to roll, but no one's still laughing, sweetheart. <clears throat> it's not a good roll, is it? It's not one of those rolls that's a couple of days old. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Sausage roll. But no, no, honestly, seriously, I'm not talking about feelings. I'm not talking about emotions. I'm not talking about that kind of love. I'm talking about the love of God which has been poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love which compels you. Faith, Galatians 5, 6 says, faith worketh by love. And so does every manifestation of the Spirit. If you want to know the quickest way to get in the Spirit, you step into love. Well, that's what Romans, that's what, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 13, we talk about, everyone says, what's 1 Corinthians 13 all about? Love. No, it's about the gifts of the Spirit. It's about the manifestations of the Spirit. He hasn't changed subjects. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14, all talking about manifestations of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 simply emphasizes that without love, none of these things which have been prior spoken about will function as they should. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not, have not love, I'm a clanging brass or a sounding, clanging cymbal. See, e everything then is tied then to, to love. Not if I have an emotion and if I, you know, feel all gooey and gushy about you. That's not what it's talking about. That, that again, like we spoke about in the offering lesson, that would be you trying to meet a need based on the external perception of what you see, rather than the love of Christ compelling you and moving you. Rather than, yes, meeting the need, but from inside motivation, from the love of God, from the heart, from the Spirit, moved by the Spirit <clears throat> to the outside. So I want you to turn with me now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Praise God. Now help me now, help me by drawing in the Spirit. Remember, there's an, as much of an anointing for you to receive and draw as there is for me to preach this. So let's work this together. Let's work this out now and release this into the atmosphere together in Jesus' name. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, now listen to this, from now on, <clears throat> from when? Some distant moment in the future? No, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Well, there's a different way to live. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, and these guys had seen Him and handled Him, the word of truth, they, they, they'd seen His glory, they'd seen His life, they'd seen His flesh, they'd seen His eyes. <clears throat> Even though they'd known Him as flesh, now, yet now we know Him thus no longer. <clears throat> so, so the disciples, the people in that, First century church uh, that may have lived long enough to have actually seen Jesus, <clears throat> they no longer considered that part of their relationship with Jesus as anything. That's an amazing statement to me. Jesus said, it is better for you if I go. If I don't go, the Father can't send the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> have you ever wondered what it would be like? You know, thought, wow, wouldn't it have been wonderful to have walked the shores of Galilee with Jesus? To have held His hand, to have looked in His face, to have heard His voice. <clears throat> and yet Jesus says, 
it is better for you if you haven't had that experience. Isn't that an amazing statement? Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. The perception, the physical perception of knowing Jesus in the flesh, it, mean, it really means nothing. Well, that's good news for you and me because we haven't. Huh. Right? And so the, the relationship we have now is actually better than that which the disciples had for those three years. That's dynamic. And so here it says, even though we've known Jesus in the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. We don't, e we, we don't even think about that anymore because we know Him on a level that is so dynamic by the Holy Spirit that it supersedes even the thought of that. <clears throat> but here's the other thing. It also says, therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. So apparently not only can we have an intimacy with Jesus on that level, but we can also have that with one another where the flesh no longer uh, is the guiding or leading or, 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 or determining factor what you look like and even your, your soul or personality no longer is how I regard you. Wow. That would, that would kind of send personality clashes out the window within the church, wouldn't it? I mean, can you? what if we actually lived like this? What if we actually were able to perceive one another by the Spirit before we even gave thought, if, if ever at all, the flesh? It would kind of take judgment out of the way. And the love of Christ compels us, for we judge thus. Now here's the judgment of love, that if one died for all, then all died. So we now see each other through the cross through the death of Jesus. Praise God. That's how love judges. Love, love sees a situation that's out of, out of whack and says, in the name of Jesus, and brings heaven to earth in that situation. That's how it does it. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. See, if we're going to truly live from the inside out, we're going to have to know how the flow of the Holy Ghost flows through us, how the love of God, and it's by love, it's always by compassion, it's always by His love for us. So God will not be held back. He's a powerful God. He is a consuming fire. He is. It's a little bit like at the end of Narnia, you know, but he's not a tame lion. <laughs> no, he's also a man of war. Scripture describes him that. We sang about that earlier. The God of angel armies is on his side. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We, we need to know Him this way, and we need to understand that love is very, very powerful. Love is dynamic. Love, love is that compassion that moves in a powerful, powerful way. Hallelujah. So here it says, you no longer live for ourselves, but for Him who died for them and rose again. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest with yourself, and I want you to evaluate this. I want you, if, if the Lord speaks to you, I want you to make the spiritual decision to, to make the adjustments necessary. But I'm going to challenge you here. Do you have a vision or an agenda? What's the difference? What's the difference? Let's go to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. We're talking about living from the inside out. We're talking about flowing from the inside out. But do you have a vision or, a, or an agenda? And 1 John 4 verse 16 says it this way. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Do we, know, do we know that God loves us in this room? Do we believe that God loves us in this room? All right, well then we can make that statement. We've known and believed the love which God has for us. God is love. Let's say that together. God is love. Okay, now this is the second time this has been repeated in this chapter here, in verse 8 and also verse 16 now. God is love. How is God? Love. God is love. Right. How is He? Love. One more time. How is God? Love. God is love. All right. 
We've known and believed the, the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God. Why? Because God is love. And God in him. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because this is the transaction. This is what's taken place. This is why we can boldly approach the throne of grace. This is why boldly in that day of judgment we're going to have a, 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 a sense of, of righteousness and not condemnation. Because as He is, how it now again, how is He? He is love. It's just, gone, it's just gone through very, in very detailed terms to say how God is. God is love. And as He is love, so are we. Where? When we get to the sweet by and by? When we get to the heavenly shores? When? In this world. Can you see that? Put this off for this, this, this heavenly existence, for the future, which is not going to be uh, many, many years anyway. <laughs> I mean, there would be a, for a start, there's going to be a thousand year rule of reign of Christ on the earth. And then he says, the scripture says in Revelation, he's going to fold this thing, oh, oh, actually it's not Revelation, but he's, he's going to fold this thing up like a napkin. This whole thing will be a new heavens and a new earth, which the book of Revelation does talk about and go into detail. And then we will be in the original plan of God as he determined and as he purposed right from that very beginning. And there will be, there, there will be a, a whole pattern that God set in place originally with Adam and Eve. In him. We have to understand this we have to live this. But as He is now, love, so are we. So what flows out of us, what is empowered, the, what compels us, what motivates us, what moves us is love. The love of God. But not your emotional based love. Why? Because all of that's been given to God. Jesus said, this is how you do it. Love the Lord your God with how much? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. So if you've done it with all, how much do you have left? So how do you fulfill what he said next from Leviticus 19.19? 19, 19, and love your neighbor. How can you now, if you've given all, if you've given all to God, how, can, how have you got anything to give anyone else? Why? Because Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God. So you, you give all of that soul-based love to him and you trust it with him. What he does is he fills you by the power of the Holy Ghost with his love. His, that's the grace of God by the, by the Spirit. He fills you with a supernatural love, a, a dynamic of love, that now as you express that from the inside out, it has an effect where it goes. Because... It's spiritual. It's not the fruit of the soul. Love is the fruit of the spirit. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual force. It's God Himself. So we, as God is, so are we. As He is, love, so are we in this world. The flow of God from the inside out. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7 in, in the New Living Translation. See, love does not have its own agenda. This is now just before I get there. Love does not have its own agenda. It doesn't, it does have vision though. Love has vision. It just doesn't have, an, have its own agenda. It, it's not self-focused, but it does have a vision. Does that make sense? Let me explain it to you. Love sees through God's eyes and it responds through the lens of His vision. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 says this, Love is patient and is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. 
Wow. Doesn't even keep a record of it. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Isn't that amazing? There is no self-centeredness or self-focus in the, any of those statements at all. It, someone, someone wrongs you, and you just keep believing in them. You just keep believing in them. That's amazing. It doesn't even remember what they did wrong. Now, I know, someone say, but there, where's the wisdom in that? I know, look, I'm not asking you to, to continually go back into an abusive situation. Okay, let, let me just make this, because some people can take this and, and misappropriate what we're saying here. God never tells you to go into an abusive situation. So there are situations there, and the scripture, we don't have time to go into it here, but the scripture, and Paul teaches, and there are other situations where it very clearly says that that's not the way you live your life. But there is a place where we are able to walk in this love, this force of love, this, this love generated from the inside out that, that does not allow those things that have been done to you to be bigger than what Jesus has done for you. Amen? And you're able to walk that out in this power of love. It's not natural. You probably figured that out already. So that's not natural. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not natural. In fact, you have to go against the natural to do that. Because what's natural is to try to, to do it from the outside in. To come up with a reason why I can forgive you. No, the reason's in here. It's what he's already done. And that flow that comes out is the power of his love. Have you ever seen, I don't know if I've seen it just once or twice in my life, I think, where where you hear a terrible, terrible thing on the news of, of somebody who's been raped and killed and so forth. And, and I've seen this about twice in my life, I think, on the news, where you see the parents say, we forgive them. That's not natural. I, I, as a parent, thinking about my kids, that's not natural. That can only be spiritual. That can only be the power of God involved in that moment. For those parents to be able to say that. They're living from the inside out. It's got eternity written all over it. Being led by this in the Spirit comes from love's vision. We see what love sees. We say what love says. We do what love does. That's how we live it. Now at times, love rebukes. Love corrects. Love encourages. Everything about the Word of God, which is all God-breathed, and good to edify, good to correct, good to rebuke, good, all of these different things that the Word of God is good for, it's all love. The flood of Noah was the love of God. It was. See, nothing that God did was outside of the rounds of, bounds of love. We have to understand that. Being led by the Spirit comes from love's vision. We will see what love sees, we'll say what love says, and we'll do what love does. Anything outside of love's vision is an agenda. If it's self-centered, if it's self-seeking, if it's self-promoting, it's an agenda, it's outside of love's vision. It's, it's challenging, isn't it? Because we, we have to evaluate our motives, our thoughts. Why are we doing what we're doing? Is it my agenda, or is it the vision of love? Is it God's vision? So an agenda considers this. Agendas consider personal self-preservation. Well, greater love has this than lo no, greater love has this that greater love has no man than this. <laughs> Get it out. That he what? Is there any self-preservation in that statement whatsoever? No, because once you've done that. You do, that's it. Are you dead? <laughs> it's like, that's it. No self preservation. They can't be enemy. That's, that's why it's the greatest love. 
But, but think, I mean, you can think of it on a much smaller scale than, you know, giving your life <laughs> so that you be dead. There's a whole bunch of stuff in life that we can do on a much smaller scale that is still, though, out of love and not self-preservation. An agenda has more emphasis on, the, on personal revelation than a hunger to receive. Uh, there's been people I've been chatting with sometimes, and it's like everything I say, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, I'm, well, I'm glad you know that. But, but you know, sometimes it, it, there's more emphasis on a personal revelation. It, it amazes me. It amazes me when I speak at a conference. Um, this didn't happen, actually, just recently, so I, I'll exclude, exclude this particular conference I was just speaking at. But there are some conferences where I've been to, and I cannot tell you how many people come up Trying, wanting to have a personal teaching session with me to teach me. To teach me their revelation. It's amazing to me. I just would never do that to a speaker. But some people can't, they've obviously sat through my entire message and all they've heard is their revelation. And they can't wait to give it to me. Well, bless their hearts. Um, you know, they've got a hold of something and, and I'll stand there and just listen to what they have to say and, I'm, and genuinely try to hear if there's something I can get out of this because, you know, I mean, maybe there's something I'm missing, genuinely. Um, but it is amazing to me at times how, how folks can, can think that way and, uh, and not hear anything else. We can't be like that. that that'll, lock, that'll lock you into denominationalism. That'll lock you into an ideology that'll lock you into cliques, uh, uh, schisms, that, that'll exclude you from working with the rest of the body of Christ. It'll exclude you from praying with anybody else. Or, do you hear what I'm saying? We, we, we've, got to, we've got to understand and appreciate and receive all of the different uh, uh, dynamics and powerful revelation that there are in the rest of the body around the place. We've got, we've got to. We've got to. Hallelujah. It also has an insistence on correcting others. We'll just leave that one alone. <laughs> no, but it, it does. Always wanting to correct. Now, now I'm going to be real, real honest with you here. I have a problem with this one. <laughs> because God's called me as a teacher. So it's, it's natural for me in my own spirit and heart of love to want to bring information that I have received to someone. I don't think I've ever gone up to a speaker after a service to do that. But, but in terms of the people that God has entrusted to me in terms of, in terms of our own congregation, now I, I learned long ago you, that you cannot give advice if it's not been asked for. So the general person out there, I'm not, I'm not going around trying to teach them. It's like, you know, the, it's like the, the fivefold ministry sitting around the table, the prophet and, and the, uh, the pastor and the teacher uh, sitting there having lunch together, three, three of them. And uh, the evangelist comes in and he not, he's so flamboyant, he knocks over the glass of water and the prophet says, I saw that coming. <laughs> and the pastor's mopping him up and the teacher says, now let me show you how that, not to do that again. <laughs> but you can see the different giftings coming into play there. Uh, and so... so there's times when you're with people and people are saying things that all of a sudden I've got seven scriptures run through my mind and I want to go into teacher mode and I want to try to correct or teach or admonish or, or something. And I honestly, I have to really step back and not insist on correcting when, it, when it, I don't need to. But that's been a challenge. And you love me anyway, right? Okay, good. A critical spirit. A critical spirit. A critical spirit. Some, someone that, you know, it, this, is, this is an awful one to, to try to get rid of. Because a critical spirit will all of a sudden help you see negative everywhere and anywhere. It'll, it'll shape that way. It, it's all of these things are, all of these things determine an agenda, not a vision. A divisive tendency. And these things, by the way, clump together. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like, you know, those, um, in the, when you see those, those washing powders that they release those enzymes or whatever, and they, they, it draw, they draw all the oil together or something and 
kind of clumps together. It's kind of like this. These negative things, they, 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 they clump themselves together. A divisive tendency. Uh, a divisive agenda. They happen, and we've got to make sure that we, we're not allowing that to become a part of our life. See, lo- love, well, as soon as you step, as soon as you step into love, none of this exists. None of it. The last one, uh, then, is demonic inspiration. Well, that should be fairly obvious. <laughs> what I mean by demonic inspiration? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying someone who is possessed, because I don't believe a Christian can be possessed by the devil, not in their spirit. They can be oppressed. But the Holy Spirit, remember, the Holy Spirit lives and is, is joined and connected to your spirit, and he's holy by definition. But, but when a person gets gets their mind on the world and the way the world thinks and they, they, they insist on, on perpetuating that, it is a demonic inspiration. How do we know this? James chapter 3. Let's quickly go there. James chapter 3. And we'll bring this to a close. James chapter 3. Is this helping you? About four of you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. Now listen to this. But is earthly, sensual, demonic. Why? Because there's only two kingdoms. It's either from one kingdom or from the other. And really, you know, Satan's kingdom is not... I mean, I I even hesitate to call it a kingdom. I even hesitate to put the word king in attachment to him. I mean, we know that that describes that kind of dominion that was taken. And he got that only because that was Adam's rightful title. Of course, now he's been stripped at the cross principalities and powers made a public spectacle of. But we understand that that wisdom, that that Babylonian system, that worldly confusion system out there is earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic in origin. And the last thing we want to do is flow like Peter flowed. Now, of course, he was in unregenerate spirit at the time. But one minute, he's revelation man. Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven, Peter's. Revelation man. See, my big R on my tunic. (laughs) And then literally moments later, Jesus is sharing just a little bit more information, a little bit more than Peter can handle. (laughs) I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. Peter's like, boys, let me handle this. (laughs) He does. And he says, and he rebukes Jesus. Jesus, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Can you imagine? He's rebuking Jesus. And Jesus just, who is anything, just looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> One minute, his mouth is flowing heavenly revelation with a heavenly vision. And the next minute, net minute, <laughs> he's, got an, <laughs> he's got an agenda that gives place to a demonic voice. Can you see the difference? Moments apart. <laughs> Moments apart. He says, for when envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. How many evil things? Gee, that gives access to every evil thing. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Can you hear the undoing of all those things I just listed there? willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. 
Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the fruit that comes out of righteousness, which we have started to study and we'll go into greater detail, comes from the spirit, not the soul. Is your vision for your life and ministry, for this church even, pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy? Is it? Is it? Or is it earthly, sensually, sensual, demonic? I, I know, I know it, these are not my favorite messages to preach at times. I know I'd rather have you all just so fired up, stirred up, you want to run around the room. But you know, as a, as a pastor, as, as, an, as, a, as called, as appointed, there's times where I have, it's important for me and the Spirit of God puts on me to address these things. And, and I love you and I'm, I trust you love me to be able to receive these words because we all need to make these little adjustments and every now and then do an inventory on these kind of things. Is it vision? Is it vision? Is it really? Or have I got an agenda? And am I willing to take this on the chin, hear it, and maybe, maybe for you, as, as you evaluate this before the Lord, you, and God says, no, nope, no worries. And you think, no, nope, it's vision. Then great. And if I'm the only one that has to adjust here, I'm fine with that too. If this is all for me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm serious about that. If, if it is, then pray for me. <laughs> hmm. if, it's, if it is scripturally, if it's scriptural, it will flow from the Spirit. If it's spiritual, rather, it will flow from the Spirit. And because it's of love, it'll never fail. Hallelujah. So let's come under the mission of love. Let's submit to that love mission of the Holy Spirit flowing through us and out of us, empowering us and enabling us. Let's, let's let love be the motivator of what what God is wanting to do through us. Because through the vision and the eyes of that love, we will truly do what God's calling us to do. We truly will live from the inside out. Remember again, the quickest way to get in the Spirit? In any situation. You may be faced with any situation this week. Lord, how do I not do this in the flesh and in the Spirit? The moment you step into love and allow your choices to be guided by that, you have stepped into the realm of the Spirit. Because God is Amen? Amen. We flooded with vision and not agenda. Hallelujah. Why don't you stand up with me? Praise the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Lord, thank you that your word instructs us. Thank you that your word is strong. Thank you, Father, that your word brings by the power of your spirit revelation to us and changes us and shapes us and grows us up. Lord, I thank you for the vision of this church, that we grow together in love. Father, that you're growing us up together in this living house of living stones, God, in this place, that we grow together in love. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for, for the, the reality of that in our lives. I thank you that from this moment on, we'll start to get a hold and a grip with that scripture that says, from that now on, we know no man after the flesh. We know one another not after the flesh. We, we've heard of Jesus in the flesh, but even that is not the same as the relationship we have with Him now. As a Father, from this point, teach us. Holy Spirit, lead us into all of this truth. Teach us and guide us. Help us. Come alongside us as you've already promised to do. We receive that help now in Jesus' name. To live out this life on a plane, on a dynamic, because we believe this is where the miraculous releases from. This is where the, the supernatural really comes and impacts the earth around us. But I don't want to live a normal life. I'm not interested in the earthly, sensual, demonic, but in everything that you have called us to. To love fervently, strongly, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you have any 
thing that you would like prayer for, if there is a need in your life, uh, or you would like us to agree with you concerning anything, then just at the end of the service, just, just if you'd like to, just make your way over to where these chairs are here, and our prayer ministers will, will pray with you, minister to you. Um, but have some great fellowship. Have a couple of tea together. Enjoy one another. Pray for each other. Love on each other. Allow yourself to, you know, when you're having a conversation with someone now, I want you to see past the, the exterior. And I want you to, to tr- in your spirit, start training your spirit how to see that person in, in the spirit, as a spirit. Join vitally to God. Amen? Bless you. Have a great afternoon.